about to get started. And one of the first things that we will do is for those numbers that we don't have the names on the screen, we'll call off um, the last uh, four digits so that we can um, meet the requirements of making sure that we have everyone um, logged in for the public record. So I'm going to start with 9997. It's Amy Bodette from OneCare. Welcome, Amy. Um, 6881. Rebecca Hines from Blue Cross. Welcome, Rebecca. 4191. Devin Green from Buzz. <laughs> Hi, Devin. Um, 9686. Sarah Teachout from Blue Cross. Welcome, Sarah. Um, 6376. Mort Wasserman. Welcome, Mort. 9069. <laughs> Vicki Lona. Hi, Vicki. 0283. Jonathan Kingston. Okay, 7438. 7438. 0538. Ginger Iris at One Care. Welcome. Thank you. Zero zero four three. Becky Lewandowski with DRM. Welcome, Becky. Five eight three five. That's Abigail. Thanks, Abigail. Four four eight five. Hey, this is Nolan from JFO. Welcome, Nolan. Nineteen seventy. It's Janine here at the office. <laughs> Thanks. 3,000. I have a feeling that's me. Jen calls UVM Medical Center. I'm on my desk phone. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank um, you. Three, three, two, one, two. Hi, it's uh, Kathy Mahoney from the Advisory Committee. <clears throat> Welcome, Kathy. 1460. Yes, hi, this is Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society. Welcome, Jessa. 5817. This is Jill Sotoff Garen with the Vermont Medical Society. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Jill. 5572. This is uh, Tom Darenthal in Burlington. Hi, Tom. 0686. This is Roger Arnold in Norwich, Vermont. Okay, I believe that everyone else I have a name popping up for. Um, is there any numbers that uh, I have missed, Abigail, that you do not have a name on? No, but I think asking if we missed anyone, they could speak up just because I see people were added as we went along. I Did haven't miss gone on yet. This is Maggie Lenz from Leonine Public Affairs. Thank you, Maggie. Anyone else? And, and Walter is here, too. Okay. Of that. <laughs> Welcome. Katie Jickling, BT Digger. Hi, Katie. Anybody else? If not, the Kylie first item. Go ahead. Sorry, Kylie Kuiper, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. <clears throat> hey, Kylie. Hello. Okay, with that, we'll go to the Executive Director's Report. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everybody, to our board meeting today. I have a scheduling update for next week. Uh, we have added a couple of meetings, um, actually one extra meeting to the schedule for April. We're going to be meeting on April 29th, next Wednesday, starting at 10 a.m. We'll have a board meeting to discuss the Northwestern Medical Center 2020 budget amendment request, and that's um, a potential vote. And then we'll be coming back uh, virtually to meet at 1 p.m. next Wednesday, and we're going to hear um, from our health insurers in the state on their COVID-19 uh, response. I have heard and confirmed uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield as well as MVP, we're still waiting on confirmation from Cigna. And I've also heard from Commissioner Pichak that he will be presenting to us on their response and some of the updated rules that they've been working really hard on. So it should be a very good meeting. Uh, that is all I have to report out today. Any questions? Hearing none, thank you, Susan. You're welcome. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, April 8th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, um, April 8th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Council Barber, if you could call the roll. Member Lunge? Member Holmes? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Useford? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So with that, we're going to uh, go to um, the One Care Vermont 2020 update. And um, Elena, are you going to do any intro, or should I go right to, to uh, Vicki? Um, I hadn't planned on it, but I think we could just, you know, tee it up with we um, – this is in response to, um, you know, board concerns around hospital solvency, um, as well as the uh, request for operational release from OneCare, and I think this is a check-in to understand the work that's been done at OneCare and to understand their role um, in the response to COVID. So. Um, I'll leave it at that. And Vicki, thank you for joining us. Welcome, Vicki. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is a sound check. Can you hear me all right? I can definitely hear you. I can't see you, but you might just be on the phone. I don't know. No, I'm actually on as a guest. What I'm going to do is try to present my screen so that you can see the PowerPoint. So let me know great. if I can and successful in those endeavors. Well, I, I can at least see you now. <laughs> there we go. That's good. There's the screen. Oh, we had it for a second. There we go. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. I'm getting to become a professional at this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks to Abigail, who helped me prior to uh, our time here together to uh, make sure that this was successful. So it seems like it was. So and it's great. For those who are following um, on the phone, I want to say that I'm starting on slide two of the presentation labeled One Care's Response to the COVID Pandemic, and hopefully those members of the board can still see everything all right. We can. Great. Uh, I would say that overall, we have a tiered approach to being able to support the delivery system and Vermonters during the pandemic. And the way that I look at it is, you know, of course, our greatest impacts come where we are partnering with either the federal, state, or payers, or the providers who are delivering some of the frontline care for Vermonters. We have, however, having said that, 
taken many independent actions, which I'll be happy to share with you as we move through this presentation to assure really that stability and predictability in payment funds, um, as well as to provide some immediate cash flow relief to hospitals, primary care practitioners, designated agencies, um, uh, home health, and uh, area agencies on aging. So that will be, um, I'll talk to you about that a little bit more during the presentation. And then, of course, as you move down, um, a lot of the uh, actions that we've initiated really do require that partnership with the federal, state, and payers it's to reduce administrative burden. We've talked a lot. We've had the, the network um, of providers really change the way that healthcare is delivered through many of the telehealth codes that um, have been approved at both the state and federal level. So thank you to our state partners and our insurance companies who have um, provided some parity for those visits. And then the Green Mountain Care Board had discussed, I think a couple weeks back, I, I lose track of time, um, really trying to make sure that there's no financial penalties related to being part of these health care reform efforts. And again, we'll talk more about that later on in the presentation. And then I'd like to kind of reveal or to provide you some more information on a new care coordination tool that really helps to identify those Vermonters who are most at risk during um, COVID-19 pandemic in ways that we can support them and their needs, as well as to make sure that um, the system has enough capacity to be able to care for them. So with, could I just ask a process check? Would you like me to move through the presentation and then take questions at the end, Chair Vaughn? Yeah, and since I can't see other board members, if they do have um, a question that they would like to get clarified immediately, they could just uh, cut in. They'll have to do it themselves as I won't be able to recognize them, but otherwise we'll hold everything till the end. Okay, perfect. So I am moving uh, my way to slide three, labeled Board of Managers Commitment to Supporting Providers of Care. Really, these are the activities that OneCare um, has been working on since the beginning of COVID-19 to assure that um, our providers have cash flow to be able to support them on the front lines, both um, with care delivery and to make sure um, that they're, they're not concerned about their financial solvency when it comes to the services that they're delivering under the ACL model. And um, list of order, and I'm not going to go into these in too much detail, but what we've heard is um, those fixed payments that are being received through both the Medicaid and Medicare program right now are really vital to the practitioners because they are predictable uh, despite the revenues um, going down at all the hospitals. I think the only wish at this point in time would be that that was a higher percentage of their overall revenues that they wouldn't have to um, be relying so much on fee-for-service in the normal payment system. We are uh, working or started a pilot program at Bennington at Southwestern Medical Center with Blue Cross Blue Shield starting in April uh, to look at a fixed payment for the qualified health plan business. So um, we'll be happy to provide some updates in May as to how that process is moving along. And Blue Cross Blue Shield has offered it up to any other um, hospital that is per participating to be able to support them for all the time. I, I would just somebody, ask uh, if everybody could mute their, their lines because we're getting some uh, um, audio that's not from Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, one of the earliest changes that we made was there 
was set to go into effect on April 1st, a change in our care coordination payment structure, which would move from a system that paid uh, based on a capacity payment to more of a performance-based payment. And given the network's um, need to really be agile and make sure that there was access to those with COVID, we felt like that was premature to um, change those payments at this time. So that has, that payment change has um, been delayed until seven one of, of this year. I think I talked last time we were here about offering those um, grantees the ability to take a pause on the innovation grants for the year if they needed to without um, repercussions or loss of income as a result of this. We have um, at our last board meeting for the comprehensive primary care reform pilot, and remember that's for independent primary care practitioners that are in um, all payer programs for which One Care Vermont has a contract, and they receive a fixed payment for the um, number of Vermonters that they have on their panel that are attributed. We did have a component of that uh, that was, yeah. Sure. Is somebody talking to me or just somebody hasn't muted their line? I think somebody muted their line. Unless, Tom, you didn't have a question, did you? That wasn't you, was it? I think it was just someone that hadn't muted their line, Vicki. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so we had uh, two quality measures uh, that uh, providers in the program could receive additional um, incentive or um, a reduction in their overall payment based on their performance in these particular measures. We do not believe that this is a time to penalize providers who are working so hard on the front line. And so we uh, took away um, any sort of financial penalties as a result of those measures. We are still asking providers to report how they're doing in those measures and still um, working on process improvement flows. Um, if there has been a significant decline um, in those measures and really digging in to see uh, what was the root cause of the decline? Was it because they needed to mobilize to support COVID or were there other circumstances occurring? I'll show you on slide four. Um, we have heard and done uh, much outreach to our primary care, both independent FQHCs, um, as well as our hospital partners to assess if we were able to accelerate some cash flow to them, would that be helpful for the months of April and May? And we overall received a very positive response that that would be something that would be helpful as they um, work their way through recovery. And so I'll show you some of those um, accounting mechanisms on the next page. We also, did, and thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board for your swift action on that, uh, have a vote to return the Medicare portion of the value-based incentive fund back to hospitals, and um, we have stopped collection of funding for the rest of the year for them as well. So that provided a little over a million dollars in relief to the hospitals for that. We are, um, because we are working with payers, and I think this was part of our recommendations to CMMI to have this year be a reporting year only on quality. So again, not to have any financial penalties tied to any changes um, in those um, quality metrics this year. We have prepared a policy change internally that um, if this was granted across all payers, we would start to release um, that funding out to the network um, in accordance with our policy on a monthly basis. So again, um, that would be 
a mechanism to enhance cash flow for them. And then um, we'll show you later on an application that was developed rather swiftly um, and, and is continuously being enhanced to really support um, those Vermonters who might be most vulnerable during during this time. So I'm just taking a pause to see if it seems reasonable to continue on or if there's any quick questions. I'll throw out a quick question, Vicki. Um, you, yeah. you talked about the feedback from everybody about um, how important the fixed perspective payments were. Um, have you had any inquiries from providers uh, about possibly having um, uh, uh, a mid-year process for allowing others to join? We had not uh, had that question posed to us. Um, I think it would be challenging with the payer contracts to bring in new lives um, in the middle of the year. But I will say that in talking with Blue Cross Blue Shield, they were um, very willing to uh, extend this fixed payment type scenario to those hospitals that um, were not currently participating in one care if that was something that um, they thought would be um, supportive of them. Okay. Kevin, may I just build on that question with a quick one? Absolutely, Jess. Go ahead. Thank you. So, Vicki, I'm just wondering, I noticed that you are piloting this fixed payment with the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP at Southwestern only, but that Blue Cross offered it to other hospitals. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just speak to why ho other hospitals, given um, the appreciation for the predictability of fixed payments, didn't jump on that opportunity. Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. In, in talking um, with the hospitals, this is an operational lift for them right now. And we had been working with Bennington for quite some time to make sure that their operations could support this. And um, they wanted to give this some time to work through Bennington to make sure that if there were any bugs per se, that those were um, fixed. Um, and that if we were to be able to identify any other areas of efficiencies, that we would be able to do that over the next month or so and then make some reevaluation. It was just really too challenging during this time for them to be able to quickly move to that type of payment because of the operational complexities. Yep. Any other questions from the board? Go ahead, this is Robin. Robin. I have a quick one. Um, Vicki, you had mentioned you'd given providers who got the innovation grants the opportunity for a pause. I was wondering what the take up on that was. So far, Robin, and I can um, get back to you if there's any change, but the last time I checked, most of the grantees wanted to continue moving forward, but they um, appreciated the opportunity at any point in time to say that perhaps um, a pause would be necessary. And so we just continue to uh, touch base with our network and our contractors to make sure that they're still in um, a, a comfortable place uh, with moving those programs forward. Thank you. I think everybody can appreciate that um, every day feels a little bit different and every challenge, every day brings a new challenge. So it's just important that we keep closer communication with our network um, than we ever had uh, previously. So um, moving on to slide four that says financial support uh, to providers. We talked about continuing to make those fixed payments to hospitals um, and the comprehensive payment reform for the independent practitioners so that uh, despite their lower billing, they can continue to receive the cash flow um, that they normally had pre-pandemic. And I believe that this um, Greenmont Care Board and the signers understand that it's really important that we continue to advocate 
to for the Medicare payments at least for this to be unreconciled at the end of the year so that it be a true fixed payment as it is with the Medicaid program because that will really provide an additional uh, level of support uh, for providers post-pandemic and to make sure that they can indeed make a successful recovery. We talked about the $1.1 million and indeed that is being returned to the network providers. We are preparing to make an advance of our May and June uh, population health payments and that is the 325 that we pay to primary care and uh, the care coordination payments that are um, the recipients of that are primary care designated agencies, home health and area agencies on aging. Uh, the preliminary estimates of that advance is roughly $2.4 million. That is an advance um, and we will be working with uh, the providers throughout the year as things start to stabilize um, to, to reconcile those payments. So just to be clear of the intent of that, but in talking with providers, the preponderance um, felt like the needed cash infusion right now was something that uh, would help them as they uh, prepare. And then we talked about the delay in the care coordination program payment model. We also made a decision, our comprehensive payment reform providers, the independent um, to allow that delay to occur for them as well. I will say in the care coordination delay from moving from an a infrastructure um, payment to a performance payment or capacity to a performance payment, we did identify that there were less than a dozen uh, primary care providers that uh, were exceeding um, the level of um, performance and participation than what would have been accounted for in the capacity payments. And so we um, have reached out to those practices and we will be providing them um, the delta between what the capacity payment would have been and um, the level of engagement that they're actively um, making right now. So I just wanted to clarify that um, the activity has been done. Thanks. Am I okay to move on to slide five? Yes. Great. So this is, uh, I've talked a lot about this in um, my reports to both the House and Senate committees on health care administration. This falls into those tiers of activities that really do uh, require a partnership between one care and our federal state and the signers of the all payer model and um, have the ability for the greatest impact both this year and as we move through uh, next year and to the completion of the all payer model agreement perhaps in 2022, depending on how activities flow. We've been very active at the national level, par partnering with the National Accountable Care Organizations to make sure that those providers who have been leaders um, in healthcare reform efforts at the federal level, because that is the way that the federal government is moving, are not penalized in any way. Um, for their activity, and we are um, seeing some movement in that direction, but nothing has uh, been affirmative in terms of how they'll be looking at shared savings or quality measures for, for this year or next year. So we're still waiting on those type of activities. Uh, we have also been working rather tightly with the state administration officials. As this um, committee knows, there were some crucial admissions um, in the stimulus payment calculations in that the uh, all-inclusive population-based payment, i.e. shadow claims, were not included in the calculations. 
um, to determine what the hospitals and independent practices would receive who were under that type of arrangement. And so we do know that a letter was sent by the administration and by a few members of our delegation to HHS, who is administering the stimulus program, and that they have reached out to CMMI to validate our findings. And um, we, as of a couple hours ago, we're still waiting to see what the timeline is for um, making sure that that data is included and recalculated and if that is indeed their intention. And then um, locally, we have been working very closely with you uh, and the other um, signers to make sure that for the Medicaid or Medicare all-payer model agreement that we're looking at those all-inclusive population-based payments. We would like them to be truly fixed so that uh, the hospitals and independent primary practitioners who are receiving those payments can rely on them uh, throughout the year. Making sure that clinicians are held harmless from any financial penalties. So again, we're, we're not stopping quality related activities. Uh, those will continue um, on throughout the year having High quality care is something that's very important to us, and we know that providers right now are working very hard to um, try to support access for for those who are suffering um, from from the effects of COVID. So we are saying, let's make sure that this year we're thinking about it as a reporting year only. Um, we'll continue to do our diligence, but we don't want any financial penalties to occur. The other big portion of it, too, is making sure that the hospital systems that are taking financial risk are held harmless for any portion um, of the Medicare payment that has been paid to advance the shared savings for the blueprint for health and supports and services at home. Um, when those discussions do occur. And I think it's always important to look at with this waiver, are there other uh, additional funding opportunities that could be provided um, to those providers who have really been leaders in the LPAIR model agreement? And as I understand it, that letter has not yet um, gone out, but is expected to, to go out sometime within the week. So that'll be very important to have those conversations and continue moving that forward. At the state um, and payer level, it's a similar theme in that really we're looking to make sure that the, the hospitals that um, are accountable for any kind of financial risk are not harmed by the impact of COVID on the program and that there's no financial penalties for any of the network. That's primary care, the designated mental health agencies, the home health, you know, for the quality reporting. And then we're always talking to payers to assess is there further opportunity to expand the fixed payments, such as with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we continue to have conversations with our network on a monthly basis and the CFOs very frequently to assess if it would be helpful if we took some of those fixed payments and um, spread them out um, throughout the month so that they had a constant infusion of cash flow. So we're keeping close tabs with them on that. And also, I think it shouldn't be... Um, taking for granted that uh, making sure that there's no additional administrative burden in the form of prior authorizations um, to protect against that. And so that's been activities that we've been working on with uh, the payers and state Medicaid um, offices. And they have been excellent partners in all of this. And I really commend their efforts and 
making sure that the health of Vermonters really take precedence. So now um, I'm going to move us along to slide seven. Oh, Somebody needs to put themselves on mute. One of the uh, applications that we were able to develop rather quickly as we were hearing um, concern that there might be individuals who were at high risk because um, either of their age or their frailty or multiple chronic conditions um, that during this time of social distancing and social isolation might not be seeking um, care from the healthcare system. So what we did is using the data that we have at One Care and criteria from the World Health Organization, the CDC, and John, Johns Hopkins is we, deliver, we developed an application that was able to identify those individuals who were at greatest risk um, during the COVID pandemic. And really the goals were to make sure that patients are safe um, and to be able to identify needs that they, they might be having during this time that they haven't reached out to their healthcare practitioners to talk about um, because of their concern of um, inundating the healthcare system right now. When I sent you this slide, we had 26 organizations who were using the application. We're up to 30 organizations as of today that are using it. The primary care providers that are using this application and um, taking the list from it have um, reported back that they're finding it very helpful in identifying individuals who perhaps weren't getting their prescriptions filled or that they weren't able to get food because they were scared to go to their local grocery store. So helping to connect them with services in their communities to make sure that they had the food and the medication that they needed to keep them healthy. Um, with some of the anecdotal findings that we're seeing, we're also adding to this application um, some food insecurity and social isolation questions as well. And we've also heard from our network that they would really like to continue utilizing this application into the recovery phase to make sure that people are being connected um, with their primary care. We've developed some nice scripting for the care coordinators to use. Um, it's called the care and concern script to identify what needs they might have. And then perhaps um, based on that assessment, they get them connected in with a telephone or a telemedicine visit with their primary care or perhaps their mental health clinician based on the findings that, that the care coordinator receives. And then moving to slide eight of the presentation, labeled providers working together create, to create a better healthcare future. Um, I thought that this picture uh, was really looking forward to the great future that Vermonters will have post pandemic and really thinking about how we continue to work towards um, transitioning to a full value-based system that indeed we found that um, during this period of time that the dependency on fee for services when um, you know certain services have to be shut down to make sure that we keep people healthy and well is is not a good long-term plan for for us or anybody um, and that Vermont has been real leaders in this. We're seeing through this process really a more consistent care model. So thinking about the work we're doing in the care coordination arena and some of the outcome findings that we're seeing based on this and um, the quality measures is really important when you have 
providers and um, working together as a true system of care to really improve the health of Vermonters. And we talked about those fixed payments really um, being vital to the point in time when the care delivery really needs to shift the way that it's delivering care. If you, if you even think about something as, I guess I'll call it simple, but I know it wasn't simple. We've, we've worked really hard with the association leaders to make sure that providers were able to make those telephone consultations and receive reimbursement for those consultations in order to make sure their um, financial solvency um, was viable moving forward. And if we were truly under a fixed payment system for hospitals and primary care, those providers would have been able to be more agile and fluid because they would have been receiving those fixed payments. So regardless of whether or not a code was in place for those services, they would be able to move quickly to provide those services to members without having to take that extra step of making sure that there were dollars and codes assigned to those particular services. So that concludes my presentation, and I will keep it up in case there's questions and I need to go back to certain slides. Super. Thank you, Vicki. Um, you, you touched on it briefly, but um, what, are your, what are you hearing from providers on the telehealth issues? I was telling the board at our admin check-in, uh, I believe it was Monday, um, that my granddaughter um, had uh, a tick engorged at her hairline, and when my son called the uh, pediatrician, they FaceTimed it, and he examined her using the phone and uh, wrote a script for um, medicine based on the, the telehealth. Are you seeing a lot more take-up of that? Yeah, we're absolutely seeing a lot more uptake of the telehealth. I would say anecdotally what I'm hearing is that um, more people are leveraging the telephone consultation and not so much the video aspects of it. I think if somebody has um, commercial insurance or a Medicaid, that doesn't present a challenge in terms of the reimbursement for it. But with Medicare, that rate is significantly lower if it doesn't have a video component to it. So we're in the process, actually, of looking at the um, claims that are coming through, seeing where the greatest uptick is. And we met, when we met as a board, this very issue of telehealth um, came up or telemedicine. And really, um, the what I'm hearing from the healthcare providers is even post um, COVID and through the recovery, this is an amazing tool to be able to provide care and that patients' experiences um, are positive during this point in time. So we're, we're going to be assembling providers throughout the state. Um, thanks to Tom D. from Bennington who had this idea to be able to get everybody together to share best practices on how things are working right now with telehealth and then looking at um, what we might need in the future to be able to continue this mode of care delivery um, and for what populations. So it's, it's really interesting in how such a short period of time um, we've, we've changed um, from some of those traditional face-to-face -face visits to these telehealth visits. Out of necessity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay, questions from the board? Hi, Kevin, it's Tom. I have a couple. Go ahead, Tom. Um, just wondering in terms of your care coordination uh, new app, you said that there were 30 organizations that uh, seem to be active on it. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you have any sense of how many people are being served by it. So um, we don't have those counts yet. So recall that um, people who are using this application, 
may or may not be using Care Navigator, and that is the place where we'd be able to really provide the, the means of account. Also, if they're not doing a billable code as a result of this, we won't be able to see um, if, you know, a service has been associated with it from a clinician. So um, we won't have absolute count, but we certainly do have the ability through Care Navigator to be able to assess um, how many people are engaging in some care coordination activities as long as they're using the app. Good, thank you. Um, I mean, this could be that I've misunderstood what I've heard, but, you know, in terms of the provider payment system, um, funds from the federal government, you know, those, mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, are based on a Medicare uh, distribution of that of the provider over the entire national uh, distribution of Medicare funds. And I've heard some say that pediatricians, because they don't do a lot of Medicare business, are um, are kind of like left outside the loop for those um, provider payment distributions. Does, does uh, that ring any bells for you? I, I have not heard um, that comment. I know that there will be multiple ways of funding, and one, as I've heard, will be uh, more towards the Medicaid um, populations, and so perhaps that's where some of the pediatric practices will get um, picked up because there will be greater emphasis there. But I have not heard. That would make sense. Um, so, and then just in terms of your view of your own organization, we, we spent, and thank you for that, a lot of time kind of looking, you know, over the fence at, at your provider network and uh, payer network. But I guess I would like to ask, what is, is you know, you know, we have risk orders uh, you know, for hospitals. What, what are the risks before the ACO for your organization that you worry about the most? I think the risk for the ACO in general um, are that providers um, won't be able to continue their participation in these healthcare reform efforts um, because of perhaps some of the penalties that might apply, uh, perhaps because of the pressures they have on them um, financially that, if you recall, the Hospitals are a big contributor to the population-based payments that go out to all the other healthcare pr providers. And if they don't have, um, you know, a healthy um, income coming in, they won't be able to participate in some of those programs moving forward or pay for some of those programs. And we um, had some delivery system reform uh, payments coming in, but certainly not to the degree in which um, the hospitals have participated in, in those funding programs. Uh, and just one more. Um, so do you see any window of opportunity to, I mean, that's a, a risk that you've just defined. Do you see any windows of opportunity in terms of federal funds, this array of federal funds that are at play. I, I noticed, for example, that um, the small state minimum, Vermont's going to get $1.25 billion, which is a lot of money. Um, it's about 78% of our general fund spending. And my understanding is in the bill that's before the House today, they are expanding the ability of states to use that money, giving states more discretion. Um, and uh, before it was just limited to reimburse COVID expenses, and right. and it's a and I don't know what the language is yet, but do you do you have any insight into any of these federal streams that that you folks might help hospitals leverage beyond what they can leverage independently? That's a great question. Most of our efforts have been focused towards um, helping the um, healthcare system really leverage the funding that's um, available to them in those first couple um, tranches that are going out for Medicare and Medicaid. But I'd like to give your uh, question some more thought because it's a really good one that there might be some additional opportunities that – uh, we as an ECO and the entire system of care um, could be uh, 
supporting um, Vermont drawing down some of those funding opportunities. So I noticed uh, um, someone sent me a, an email from our state budget office. Um, as a, you know, to the National Association of, of, of Budget Commissioners. And, you know, because there are 24 states that are small state minimums, it's quite a coalition that can be put together in terms of, yeah. um, of, of uh, helping define what's eligible and what's not. Uh, when you have 24 yeah. states, you know, um, that, that's quite a coalition across the country. And uh, I just, you know, I, I just... Uh, um, you know, I, I know it's a fast-moving environment, and I don't envy you, but, you know, it, it's, uh, um, I mean, that's all I have to say about it. It's a lot of money, a lot of opportunity. The flexibility is growing rather than diminishing, and uh, um, I'm, I, you know, I'm just hopeful that, you know, in, in the scheme of things, the holes in, in your budget are probably quite small relative to the ones out there in the field, and um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a fair statement. That's why much of our efforts have really been geared towards um, doing everything that's within our control and advocating for providers to receive uh, funding that they need to not only continue and make it through COVID, but to be able to participate um, both once we we move to a, a brighter future. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Tom. Robin, do you have questions? I think I asked most of my questions as I went along, um, or someone else already has. So I think I'm good. Thank you, Robin. Maureen, do you have any questions? Uh, nope, I'm good as well. Thank you. Okay. Jess, do you have any questions? I do. I just have two, I think. Um, one, Vicki, the board approved the return of the Medicare portion of VBIF to hospitals, and I'm wondering if you were able to return the Medicaid portion of VBIF to hospitals. If I recall, that was a significant amount. It is a significant amount. We had put in a verbal and written request. We have not received a response yet, so okay. we have not been able to return that funding. Okay. And how much was that amount? I think I can double check. I think it's close to four million in Medicaid. Okay, and uh, that's how, why we had prepared the policy. Um, if Medicaid did allow for it, to be able to send that money out to hospital primary care designated agencies on a monthly basis, so that way the whole system is cared for um, with that value base and send it fund. Okay, thank you. And my second question um, revolves a little bit around some of the programming for the 2020 budget. Um, I'm thinking about programs like Rise Vermont and Dulce, which require social connection and in-person, you know, engagement, walks, you know, in in the town together, and house home visits, you know, for um, new families. And so my recollection is that's, you know, close to $2 million that was in your budget. And I'm just wondering if you've thought about that in this current social distancing uh, stay-at-home world that we're in. Yeah. I think it's becoming more and more reality. And um, at our board meeting in April, we really um, did have some uh, active discussions about what our focus needs to be and where we need to look to um, make sure that we continue funding in places that we might need to uh, scale back. Um, and to your earlier great points, RISE Vermont is one that does require a lot of social connection. And so we can keep that going at um, a minimum level, but we don't have um, an intention to scale that further this year. And so I think you'll see that as a change um, when we come back in May. Okay. And actually, this is just a, my, my last question, and I'm not sure that you have the answer to it. It's not specific to your budget or your, uh, and maybe beyond your scope of knowledge, but I'm just sort of thinking about, is are there uh, is the possibility that because we're seeing fewer non-COVID sick visits, um, in primary care offices, people staying at home, not having work injuries, not 
uh, you know, getting sick from flus and things like that because they're at home. Um, we're yeah. hearing about fewer visits, uh, and that's affecting, obviously, the revenue for a lot of the independent and primary care practices. Now that we have telemedicine ramping up in terms of reimbursements, I'm just wondering, is it, is it possible that we could be seeing more provider outreach in ways that would actually see some improvement in some of our quality metrics, like providers possibly having time where they didn't before to, you know, sort, sort of along the lines of your um, care coordination prioritization app, but even beyond that, um, just reaching out to their panel um, that they had didn't have time for before in ways that might actually improve some of our quality measures. Just a yeah. big, big 40,000 foot question, but. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question and it will be interesting to see, um, you know, a, as we track this uh, COVID application and those visits that kind of start off as a care and concern kind of non-billable from a care coordinator and if we can then make an assessment of how many of those patients um, actually made it a, a billable telehealth code at the end will be interesting to see. I know that uh, our chief medical officer, Dr. Ward, um, actually, uh, you know, reached out to some of his um, patients using this application and um, has found it quite helpful right, um, to be able to have that connections and ways to individuals that he might not have had um, previously. So I think there's a yeah, lot just, to learn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Before I turn it over to uh, the, the public uh, in a minute for uh, comments or questions, I, I'm going to uh, ask staff uh, through Elena um, if they have any questions. And while you're preparing to answer that, Elena, I had one final question for you, Vicki, and that is you talked about the $1.1 in direct relief to the hospitals, and you talked about the $2.4 in advance payments. Can you tell us what period of time those advance payments cover? Uh, they do cover the months of May and June. So we were making a payment. Well, actually, they're April, May, and June, so three months. Okay. It, it, are you giving any consideration, um, depending on how um, this plays out, um, doing something beyond the June timetable? I think um, that's going to have many uh, factors associated with it um, in terms of our revenues coming in uh, through delivery system reform. We're still having discussions with the state uh, about that and whether or not we're um, able to continue to make those types of advancements. Okay. So, Elena, do you have any questions? I think the board covered most of my questions. I think, um, you know, we'll be interested to see where where May lands, uh, where it brings us, to, and I think we'll have more questions at that time about more precise relationships between funding and, and, and the response. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to the public for public comment. Would anyone from the public wish to make a comment? Go ahead, Mark. Um, this is all anecdotal, but I've been speaking to lots of physicians and some patients as well about this telehealth experience. And I think we can anticipate that healthcare will never be the same when this all settles down because there is incredible advantage to not having to go to a physician's office. You, we forget that in the early 20th century and right until the last half of it anyway, physicians and nurses visited in families' homes. And it was only for the convenience of physicians that it all got switched around to where patients had to come into physicians' offices. Really, physicians used to drive around. Now they don't. So all of a sudden, uh, consumers don't have to go to physicians' offices 
And uh, as a physician, I can tell you that the physical examination is but a small part, a very small part of what happens in a what happens in a healthcare encounter, except for specific things that take measurement that cannot be accomplished remotely. A lot of it is simply listening and eliciting symptoms. And I think that the insurers are going to have to come around and see that this is possibly much better for patients and actually probably better for physicians and providers of health care and their lifestyles as well when this all settles out, provided that payment is possible and quality can be assessed. Thank you, Mort. I think that uh, is something we're hearing from everyone. I don't, I don't think necessarily. Uh, are you expecting a comment back from Vicky or? No, just to say, tell Vicky she did a great job. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mort. Thanks, Kevin. Mort. Could I make a comment in response to Mort's comment? Certainly, Robin. Um, I. I think that thanks more for your comment. It's great to hear um, the anecdotal report uh, on how that's going. Um, one concern that I had in terms of the, the telehealth language that the legislature passed is that it is time limited. So if we were to come out of the state of emergency, uh, but um, but it, prior to the first of the year, there it could be a gap uh, there between the authority to continue telehealth. So I just wanted to mention that because uh, obviously our legislature is still in session and so folks may want to raise that issue if they are also concerned about that. Thank you, Robin. Very good point. Other members of the public? Hi. Yeah, um, Mike. I yeah. heard Mike Fisher. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Kevin on the board and Vicki. Um, I don't know whether Vicki would have a perspective on this. Um, I totally understand uh, it makes sense why the prospective payments have been so valuable during this time when uh, there's a great deal of non-COVID care that has not been being delivered. Um, my question is, and of course, we don't know what happens next when we move past the crisis stage of this, um, but if in the next phase there is a wave of pent-up demand uh, coming at our provider community, um, how, uh, how, and, and there's a need, a potential need to ramp up some um, capacity to manage that, how is that going to I wonder if you have a perspective on how the finances of that will work. I think it's a great question and one that we really don't know the answer to right now. I think, of course, you'll see that um, people will need to be receiving their elective surgeries and procedures. I don't know what the timeline for doing that and whether or not you see that immediately within the first couple of months or if this is going to be an over time. I also think that providers right now are trying to think about when we come out of this and start moving into recovery, is there another um, phase or resurgence that we need to be planning for until such time that we actually have a vaccine? So I think that's another very unknown variable in the equation right now that we have to plan for in our recovery period, um, which from what I'm hearing could be anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Thanks. Okay, other members of the public? Chair Mullen, this is Kathy Fulton. I'd, I'd like to share, share some information. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, everybody, and I, I just want to um, reinforce Vicki's assertion that telehealth has exploded. Um, we, VPQHC, the Vermont Program for Quality in Healthcare, has been very aggressively partnering with um, the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center to provide twice weekly office hours. Uh, we had an exceptional session this morning um, going into the details of some of the 
coding and reimbursement um, challenges uh, that were that um, were faced with across federal, state, commercial programs. Um, but to kind of answer some of the discussion, um, both uh, Dr. Wasserman and Jessica, as you've um, shared, uh, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, Dr. Norman Ward from One Care Vermont is hosting a conversation um, and you know facilitating a discussion on the future of telehealth for Vermont providers. Um, everyone within earshot of, of this message, you're welcome to join us. You can go onto the VPQHC website to get the registration information, but um, we will be addressing and looking to exactly what you described, Dr. Wasserman, and how we continue to support uh, the preparation going forward because, um, you know, we've all heard on, on, in several uh, channels this isn't this isn't just the first time. This will lead us into the new normal, and we can expect more and um, preparation and management of very um, things like pent up demand and what would be the quote unquote normal um, care delivery. Uh, how this has to be modified and um, expanded going forward. So we welcome all of your um, engagement and suggestions and um, continue to support the effort on a statewide basis. And we're happy to answer any questions anytime. Thank you, Kathy. Other members of the public? Hi, this yeah, is Jeff. Hi. Go ahead. Hello. Sure, this is Jessa with the Vermont Medical Society, and I just want to thank Vicki for all the work One Care is doing and echo what she stated about practices really looking to predictable payments going forward. And we're hearing particularly at the national level from family physicians a real interest in moving towards more capitated payment systems. And so we are looking forward to working with, with One Care on that with, with the primary care practices and um, seeing what the future can bring and what we can learn from this experience. Um, also, just to um, Tom Helen's question, we have heard that concern about the Medicare advanced payments being, um, they're distributed based on your percent of Medicare fee-for-service payments, so it has favored those types of practitioners who have a high percent of Medicare versus Medicaid patients, but we are also, um, as Vicki mentioned, hearing that future, hopefully future waves of funding will address that and um, go to, to pediatricians and others that have a lower Medicare number. Thank you, so, Jessica. Th thank you. For, thank you. And I heard Hello. someone else trying to get in. Go ahead. Yeah, this, yeah. this is Anne Marie Christensen, representative on the Health Care Committee. Um, I took note of the telehealth um, expiring, you know, January 1st, and knowing the legislature, we're just going to take bills up that are important and COVID-related, but somehow or other, you should probably, you know, hop on to that, so whoever is in charge, get some information to the both health care, Senate and, and House. Um, the other part is, I personally had a great experience with telehealth. It's it's just like mind changing, you know, with talking to the doctor on the phone. But also is I don't think when you're uh emailing your doctor through your electronic medical record, I don't know if that is covered. Um it may be in the bill that we passed, but I'm not quite sure. But that's also been very helpful. Um so anyway, these are things to think about of getting some proposal ready that could go in on a short time frame while we are in there voting electronically. Would you like us to send something to you or to Jen Carby, or how would you like that done, Representative Christensen? I would think I would send it to the chairs of both committees, um, okay. the Senate and the House, um, Bill and Jenny Lyons. So, Robin, can you uh, volunteer to take on that task? Sure. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
You know, I think back and uh, I remember being a, a sponsor when I was in the legislature on one of the first uh, what we were calling telemedicine at the time. And and uh, people thought that uh, it, it would never uh, go anywhere. And now you look at uh, how it's uh, expanding so rapidly in this uh, unprecedented time. And, you know, telehealth um, has some great use as we try to face uh, workforce shortages, uh, especially in rural areas in the United States. So um, I'm glad that so far things seem to be working very well. Other members of the public? Yeah, yeah uh, hi. This is Aronoff from the Development. Go ahead, Susan. Council. Hi. Um, so I just, and I don't know, uh, Mr. Chair, if this is a question for uh, the board staff or for Vicki Loner, but I'm just trying to get a handle on what percent of um, one care's fixed payments, you know, um, what that represents in terms of like overall health care costs, either of uh, one cares or in the in the state, but specifically yeah. one cares costs. So like we keep hearing about, you know, the benefit it is that for this money to be going out ahead of time, and we don't know yet how we're going to chew up the system for the services that are being provided. But anyway, I'm just trying to get a sense of what percent of money is now moving um, in these prospective payments. Thank you. This, this is Elena. I'm, I'm happy to try to take this question. Um, that is a very tricky number to come up with to find the appropriate denominator of what could be a fixed payment. Um, so I don't have a, a great statistic, but what we do know is that of all the healthcare expenditures, and some of those could never be a fixed payment, um, these one care six payments amount to only 7%, um, and that includes Medicare, which is not a true capitated payment. So there's a lot of room to go here. Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I, again, I don't think it's the right denominator because it it's over all of the healthcare expenditures. Um, but that is the back of the envelope um, estimate for 2020. It's it's all a right. very low number, and if it was already um, uh, more scale um, at this particular point in time, we would be so much better off. Yeah, I I think that's what we're hearing from our uh, network is that if more of their um, payments or revenue were actually fixed, they would be able to be way more agile right now um, and wouldn't um, be facing some of the financial um, concerns that they currently had when they're um, operating under a fee-for-service model. So I would agree we need to go farther, and I, I think this is – just further proof that our current system that we've spent years and decades um, doesn't support us during these type of crises. And then can I just ask a follow-up? So, because I still don't really have a sense of how much of one cares money is, is going out in those payments, but maybe another question is, oh, how many other providers other than hospitals are receiving um prospective payments at this point? I know there had been six primary care practices, but are, are there more than that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Vicki, I mean, you can probably comment on the more recent numbers, but per your submission, I think you're were, you were estimating 35% of all of the payments of one care payments yeah. are fixed. And then I, we have certainly the breakout in the budget details that were submitted this yeah. fall of which providers are, are participating or yeah. not. So, Sue, I'm happy to point you to those resources online yeah. if right. that's easier. Yeah, yeah that would be yeah. cool. But are there more but than there six? I mean, I know that the hospitals are receiving prospective payments, and my recollection was that there were six independent primary care practices receiving fixed payments for 2020. Um, and that was from the budget submission. But I, I just didn't know everything has changed so much. So I didn't know if there were mm -hmm. a, um, additional ones. Um, this, if you know that now, great. Have... If you want to follow up offline, that's great too. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think probably just um, I don't have the exact numbers 
Susan, but there are um, independent primary care practitioners that do receive the fixed payment and they're actually part of some of the stimulus recruitment we're trying to make because they were under that fixed payment as well. Yeah, I think seven of the 35 independent practices are taking fixed payments. And that's practices, not positions. Yes. Right. Thank you. Okay, are there other members of the public? So, oh, <laughs> that wasn't on my end. <laughs> I will say, though, Jess, if uh, by any chance I drop off quickly, the, the, there's been some severe gusts of wind here as I'm sitting. And this morning when I was on another Skype uh, event, I lost power. So if you lose me, take over quickly. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, I'm going to thank you, Vicki. And uh, I'm going to um, now move to the Blue Cross Blue Shield non-standard um, QHP plan. And Amarin, if you're on the line, if you wanted to try to set that up for us. Sure. Uh, for the record, Amarin Abergelli, Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, today's presentation from Blue Cross Blue Shield is to present a proposed plan design for their non-standard QHPs um, for the 2021 plan year. Earlier this year, the board adopted a process and criteria to review non-standard plan designs from carriers. Blue Cross's proposed plan design for the 2021 year was um, uh, was discussed with DFR and DIVA, and DFR made the determination that the proposed changes were sufficient to trigger board review. And so today will be a presentation from Blue Cross, and they will be requesting um, the board review the proposed plan and approve, I'm assuming, uh, requesting that the board approve those changes for their 2021 non-standard plan design. And Amarin, would that vote be today? It is scheduled for a potential vote today if the board is comfortable doing so. Great. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca Hines. And Rebecca, if you could um, introduce your colleagues and uh, proceed with the uh, presentation. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. So I'm going to have Martine, who is also um, with me, along with Kathleen Clark from um, Blue Cross. Martine's going to actually present. So um, I'm not sure if someone has to give her the right to put the slides up or how that works. I already gave you all the permission. Okay, great. So so those are up. Um, Martine, you want to put the slides up? Uh, can you see them now? No, but it says loading. <laughs> now we can. Great. Thank you. All right, they're still loading for me, but I, oh, here they come. Okay, so we are um, here today to uh, talk about some um, plan design changes that we would like to make, and I'll explain kind of why we're here when we don't normally come for the non-standard plans um, as we get further into the presentation. So uh, next slide. Oh, and please feel free to ask me any questions as we go. That That is uh, no problem at all. Um, so we're going to just do an overview of the market, what we already have in place, um, just to orient everybody. And then we will um, talk about the proposed changes and then have a discussion on, um, you know, any questions you might have about those changes or about the plans in general. And then um, hopefully you will feel like you have enough information to vote. Um, just as a matter of course, these plan designs are uh, in front of DFR, so they're doing their ACA compliance forms review, and it's not necessarily dependent. That work wouldn't stop if we need to, if you need more information, but I hopefully will be able to give you everything you need to make a decision today. Um, next slide. So, 
So um, this is just an overview of our products. Um, we offer all the standard plans um, as dictated by DIVA and the catastrophic plan. And then we typically have had um, two non-standard um, plan design options. And the non-standard high deductible plans are, are not in front of you today. Um, those have the typical um, cost chain, the cost share changes that are required in order to maintain AV values, um, and those those did not trigger uh, Green Mountain Care Board review. And then we have um, three other non-standard plans. They they're just different metal levels of the same plan. Uh, they're very very similar to what we were previously offering, but the benefit enhancements that we're looking at do trigger. Um, review and I'll, like I said, I'll go through why um, that's the case. So if we could go to the next slide. Again, if you have questions, just let, feel free to let me know. So the way that the ACA is set up is you cannot change a product from one year to the next unless your changes are considered a uniform modification. And the idea there is because people are typically auto-enrolled into the same plan for the next year, the ACA regulations protect buyers from getting a dramatically different plan. So there's the criteria in the second bullet are what will trigger, what allows you to consider something a uniform modification, meaning we're going to treat it as the same product even though it's not exactly the same. So the company remains the same, the network is the same, meaning you can't switch, a, you know, an EPO product to an HMO product and call it the same product. Um, the product co covers the same service area, and the product has the same covered benefits. So those are all um, things that we've satisfied. And then there's this, I think, slightly less than clear um, provision where, and I've just this is the actual language from um, the regulation, um, that each plan has the same cost-sharing structure as before the modification, except variations in cost-sharing are related solely to changes in cost and utilization of Medicare um, or to maintain the metal tier level described. So the, just to, I think you see some of this from DIVA's presentations every year, but every year we all have to go and um, recalculate the AV values for each of the plans and tinker with the benefits so that they comply with the requirements. And I think probably that this, this last one that we're not satisfying here um, is intended to sort of capture those routine changes to cost share. So we are adding some new benefits to our existing um, plan design, and because of that, it doesn't really fall into one of these categories and will be treated as a new plan. Um, in the past, uh, I think it was just this year that we designed um, a process where things that are considered new plans, meaning they're not being uniformly modified under this regulation, would go to the Green Mountain Care Board for review and approval. So that's why we're here today. Is, are there any questions about sort of the, that? Any questions from anyone? Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So this is the um, non-standard plan that we're talking about today. Um, we used to call this the Blue Rewards Plan, and this um, is the name that it has this year. Um, it's, a, it's also sometimes internally called the non-standard deductible plan. The first bullet shows you our current enrollment in the different metal levels. So we have a gold, silver, and a bronze offering here, no platinum. Um, and these are the current enrollment numbers. So these are the people that if um, this plan design has changed, they will be, I will work with the FR on this, but they would be auto-enrolled into this new plan if they didn't switch for any reason. Um, we are going to change the Blue Rewards name. This plan did used to have a monetary incentive to do some um, various health screening type act wellness activities. We did we rolled those back this year so the so we've been struggling a little with the name um, for this year. So this with the new enhance enhancements we will change the, the plan design, the plan marketing name if you will. Um, that's not ready yet um, and that process is moving along. You know, we're doing market testing, that kind of thing. 
Um, so the benefits are going to be exactly the same, subject to the normal cost share um, changes to keep the, a the actuary value um, level correct. Um, but there will be new benefits for individuals who are diagnosed with diabetes and heart disease. And we've worked with um, teams, internal teams, to come up with a benefit design that we hope will support um, higher levels of chronic condition management and compliance and hopefully help people stay healthier with these conditions. Uh, next slide. Um, and so these are the design principles that we generally apply when we're designing uh, product features. You know, we want there to be value to the coverage. Um, you know, we're always struggling against the best benefits, cost the most money. Um, so that's always sort of a balancing act. Um, we do know that the market appreciates simplicity. Customers do not appreciate complex product designs. They call a lot when they don't understand their benefits. Um, so we do try to keep benefit design as simple as we can. Of course, in the healthcare world, that's, you know, not always that simple. Um, and then we want to be able to um, create and maintain access to no-cost or low-cost preventive care, primary, and behavioral health care visits. So those are sort of the, the framework that we applied in this, in this process of creating this new product design. Um, next slide. So in general, we're feeling pretty good about our QHP population, um, preventive care um, participation. Here's some, um, you know, basic statistics on, um, you know, we have 73% of women 50 to 74 getting their mammograms, 75% um, of women having their cerv cervical cancer screening, 70% um, 50 to 75 getting their cholesterol screening, um, when it's appropriate. So we're feeling pretty good about those numbers. Those are pretty positive. Um, we do a lot of outreach campaigns in these areas. We have a quality team that's um, sort of regularly looking at this data and trying to, you know, increase these numbers. We work with providers. Um, so, so this is, um, in general, we're feeling good about this, but we do have 10% of um, the Blue Cross's QHP population has heart disease and 5% um, have diabetes. Uh, next. Next slide. So as we were looking at opportunities for doing something creative in this space, we did take a look at what the state is doing in the various different um, areas where state um, entities are working on pu public health initiatives. And here are just a few things that are um, in place that do recognize diabetes and heart disease as important diseases um, to try and help people um, manage more appropriately. And we noticed, too, that the APM has a goal around um, reducing the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease, including um, COPD, diabetes, and hypertension. So we felt like these, these um, disease states were probably appropriate, consistent with, you know, state policy goals and also um, hopefully for, with our member, you know, interests as well. So next slide. So we also have um, determined that our internal care management programs do pretty well with these members, that we have good solid programming in these Bases, um, and so that helped us sort of focus on these conditions. And then we had our clinical teams and our customer service teams sit down and talk about what they thought um, would help our members that have these disease states, um, how, how they, what they were hearing on the phones and what the science shows on um, obstacles to managing their care. And so that process went on for several months, and coming out of that, these were the benefit enhancements, and these are the things actually that are triggering your review today. So we are proposing that we will add three office visits per member with no cost share um, that have these diagnoses um, for these specialists that were, that were um, identified by our clinical teams as being the most appropriate to help manage these conditions the most effectively. Um, additionally, we're adding uh, certain drugs to the um, wellness drug list, which means that they will be subject to cost share, but they are not subject to the deductible. 
So you're paying um, a percentage of the cost, in, or copay, I'm not actually sure which it is, but um, instead of having to wait to exhaust your deductible for these drugs. So it includes insulin. Um, and these, again, were picked uh, based on sort of the science of what's appropriate for these um, conditions. And then additionally, we expanded the nutritional counseling um, limits. So there's no limits for the members that have these uh, diagnoses. So it might make sense um, to ask if there's any um, questions about those benefits specifically. We can come back to these, of course, but um, any questions about those enhancements? I have a quick any board one. member have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick one. With the nutritional counseling, there's no visit limits. Is there cost sharing? I believe there would be cost sharing. Uh, Martine or Kathleen, is there cost sharing? Uh, this is Martine. I believe there is cost sharing on these visits. Okay. Thank you. What would be a copay for a nutritional counsel? Martine? It, um, I believe it follows uh, all the other specialist copayments. So we do have um, detailed benefits uh, on, I think it's the next three slides. Oh, no, actually, we'll get in. There is detailed in the slide deck. There are um, the charts that I think you see um, when D, that is in the same format that you typically see when DIVA comes and does the standard plan changes um, that have this level of detail. So if we want to maybe let's go over the next slide just quickly, and then we can show, bring up one of the detailed slides and maybe take a, a look at that. So this is just a summary in a chart form of the changes between the 2020 plan designs and the 2021 proposed plan designs. Up at the top, you'll see that there are some uh, modifications to the cost share. This is, as I said, sort of the routine um, tinkering that we have to do with the cost share in order to maintain the AV levels. Um, and then here are really the new benefits. Um, the office visits and the wellness drugs, and then the um, nutritional counseling visits didn't get on here. But um, so that's just a summary. Now, if we want to go to the next slide, we can bring up a, a, a detailed summary or a detailed chart on the plan design changes. So here's the gold plan, um, and so the specialist office visit um, would be forty dollars for for uh, this one. Now, it would be subject to the deductible for the nutritional counseling. Now, in green is what is changing or being added. So just a question on the nutritional counseling before, was there a limit to the number of visits? Because if there's still a copay, just, just wondering what the difference is. What's the limit? on the nutritional counseling. Kathleen, do you know? The, yeah, the current limit was three visits. So this would remove that limit and allow the member to access nutritional counseling um, in, you know, for it's more uh, sessions. Okay. So before they would have three visits that would have been at the copay and then they would have to pay 100% and now they would get unlimited visits, but they would do the copay. Is that how we should think about that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Hi, Kevin. I, I just want to follow up with Jess's question. She beat me to it that, uh, you know, we're looking here at managing diabetes um, as opposed to preventing diabetes. And our, um, our policies that we adopted, I think, I think back in uh, February sometime, uh, emphasized under the category of innovation uh, prevention. Um, I'm looking here at Blue Cross Blue Shield's bronze plan for the current year, and the specialist copayment at that level is $90 um, in, in their marketing document of uh, where they're entitled Managing Joe's Type 2 Diabetes. Um, so. Um, I, I just I just worry that that the focus here is not on prevention, um, where the CDC program, which is considered the flagship, 
uh, is a program of nutrition and and, and fitness, and um, I'm not sure that that uh, this uh, gets us all the way there. I would agree that this is not aimed at prevention. Blue Cross does have other programs that are not necessarily tied to this particular benefit enhancement um, involved in, um, you know, focusing on prevention. We do a lot of work internally talking about how to um, encourage people to exercise. We do a lot of community events, or at least we used to do community events, to try and encourage people to be active. Um, we do um, uh, kind of monitor um, some of the, you know, behaviors that are associated with prevention. So there is a lot of activity in this space, but for this benefit enhancement, this is for people who already have um, the diagnosis, and it's intended to help them manage our chronic conditions. I will say that one of the things that we've sort of been talking about internally is a little bit of a gap on the, um, you know, I think wellness and enc encouraging a healthy lifestyle. We've been doing a lot of that work, but we are looking at um, not leaving behind the people that are, um, that do have these diagnoses and not alienating them from that wellness messaging and um, trying to be mindful of meeting people where they where they are and encouraging even people who might feel like, well, I'm not healthy enough to do X, Y, and Z, trying to have messaging that really still speaks to them and encourages them to live their best life wherever they may be from a health perspective. Uh, but, yes, this benefit enhancement is for uh, people that are already diagnosed. But it's certainly not the only thing that we're doing. Any other questions from the board? So I, um, for some reason, can't see the slides. Uh, but I can't either. Same here. I thought yeah, maybe you had taken here. them down. <laughs> No, it's still saying I'm presenting. Who just said that? That was Martine. This is Martine. Um, it's still telling me I'm presenting, but I can uh, I can try again. Still nothing. Nope. Oh, nothing's happening. Oh. Mine says loading now. Oh, yep, me too. There we go. Ta-da. I, I think I might be in the same windstorm as you, Chair Mullen. So <laughs> if it goes out again, let me know. <laughs> um, so these next two slides are just the same detail. So that's, this is the gold, um, and then we have the, the um, silver and the bronze. And then um, if we want to go to slide... Um, 15, we can um, sort of go through the evaluation criteria. So these are the criteria, um, oh, well, next slide, previous slide, 14, I guess it is. Um, these are the criteria um, that we have for evaluating uh, the change. And so um, the substantial difference in deductible or maximum out-of-pocket compared to standard plans this is not really being changed by this benefit enhancement, but these plans, except for the benefit enhancements, have been in place since the beginning. Um, so it, it's not clear that this criteria is probably really relevant for the benefit enhancement analysis. Um, so substantial cost share differences for one or more highly utilized services compared to standard plans. This um, benefit is not available in the standard plans for people with diabetes or a cardiac condition. 
Um, the plan structure difference compared to standard plan designs, again, these are unique benefits um, compared to what's available on the um, standard plans. I will note that this benefit here, the three uh, primary care physician and mental, or mental health visits at no cost share, this is a, a, something that's been in place with the Blue Rewards plans since they were first introduced. So this is, that first part is not new. Um, those are staying, that benefit remains, um, and then the qualifying specialist visits that we just talked about um, enhances innovation. And we're excited about um, the idea of, of focusing benefits on supporting chronic care management, um, and I think we're going to watch this closely, and, and if this seems to be doing well, we might be, you know, expanding our, the targeted conditions. And then um, the last one is adds value. Um, to the Vermont Individual and Small Business Health Insurance. And again, the, there is not currently any product that f helps people with these specific conditions. So we feel like it, it does offer something that's not otherwise available. Any questions about this, the, the criteria and the proposal? Questions, anyone? I guess I just have a quick one about that last point. Will you be specifically marketing to people with diabetes and cardiac conditions and suggesting that they switch over given that there's these benefit enhancements? I think, I mean, the marketing is still underway, but I would assume that we are going to encourage people to look at these plans as maybe a more appropriate choice for them versus some of the other plan designs. Thank you. So I have, I have a question. The, as I recall, the Blue Rewards program was that you got a debit card for about 300 bucks if you went through these four relatively, uh, you, you know, the, these, these four kind of administrative exercises, um, not physical exercise, but, you know, I think some of it was a kind of a fill out an assessment, et cetera. And I'm just wondering about the finances here. So there, you, you're, you're terminating blue rewards and that, um, on a, on a per patient basis the allowance was $300. Do you know how much you're saving there and how much the reduced cost of the specialist, uh, is offset by the savings from blue rewards? So we did get rid of the blue rewards debit card for this plan year. Um, the, the, um, uh, Martine would probably need to speak more knowledgeably. I'm not sure that we have detailed information yet. Um, we did get rid of the blue rewards, not so much because the cash payments on the debit cards were that expensive. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't bother to get that benefit. Um, but the, there did not at all appear to be any connection between improved health and using the, um, doing the steps that you needed to get the, the financial reward. So we really wanted to try some, we're really interested in seeing if there are ways to get benefit designs um, to help have better health outcomes. And so uh, we didn't feel like the cash um, reward was accomplishing that. Yeah. Uh, but we did roll that back for the 2020 plan year, so that's not available. Um, Martine, do we have any um, preliminary numbers about how much we hope that, um, you know, people's overall health spending for these conditions may improve. Um. So we haven't, this is Martine, uh, we haven't done a specific analysis for members with these diagnoses. We, um, we know, you know, we, for the overall uh, actuarial value of these plans to continue to meet the metal levels, we uh, we accounted for these cost share differences in that overall population analysis, but we haven't looked at specifically, um, you know, member A with diagnoses of diabetes, this is what would happen because the ranges of, of care between members, you know, we have some members that are currently well managed that might just get that one, you know, um, visit at the podiatrist and we'll be saving $40. So that's not a lot of savings, but the fact that they can go to the podiatrist has a lot of value that is beyond just a $40 copay. 
and, and we're really hoping that these visits will get members to keep up with the managing their condition so that in the future years, they don't have a lot of, of claims. So I don't know that it would be a one year look that would be yeah. very telling if these, if these products are, are doing what we hope they will, they will do for these members. Well, I, I would just say that you're on a better track to hear than I remember a year or so ago looking at the, you know, the $300 benefit and seeing where it could be used. There was a whole list of different vendors where, you know, someone could get a massage, they could buy a tea time at a golf course, uh, and it just seemed to be kind of random activities that weren't tied to any kind of uh, uh, managed plan to move people along. Uh, with either preventing the diabetes or helping them once they're diagnosed. So um, I, I'm not I'm not asking the question uh, in order to say, gee, I missed the $300 uh, debit card because um, I know a lot of people look at it was a Benny, but it, it's it didn't seem to be an investment in preventive health to me. Well, we're, we are excited. I, I, I hope, you know, it will take Martine's point. It probably will take some time to see um, if this makes a difference or not, um, but we're hopeful. You know, we, in addition to talking to our clinical staff, we did talk to our customer service folks about what people were complaining about on the phone as far as barriers to care. So this reflects, um, to some extent, people's perception of, um, you know, obstacles that they face. Any more questions? I think we have one more slide. This is just um, our success metrics. So these will be the things that, you know, what, we, what we're hoping um, will occur, um, you know, encouraging members to see the appropriate specialists at the right time. Um, we're really hoping to increase medication adherence, um, including insulin, um, where we are, um, you know, the, we hope to continue to leverage our successful care management programs in this space. Um, and we are um, working with, planning to be working with One Care, obviously, as you heard, lots of things are on hold at the moment. Um, for their attributed members, um, you know, hope the wellness activities that we normally have, annual screenings that are um, provided for all the ACA compliant plans. Um, so these these are all things that we hope in the totality will really encourage people to um, have a better health outcome. Check my blood. Any questions about this slide? Any questions on the board? So, uh, is this the ending questions, or just the questions on this slide? No, no. Go, I think the last, the last slide is this slide. <laughs> go right ahead. So fire away, Tom. <laughs> so, so um, when we met in February, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, and I could be off the wall here, but it seems to me that foundational to all of these QHP plans is the benchmark plan that that uh, we have uh, at the federal level. And they have opened up the gates a little bit um, to allow states to amend that plan. Um, ours goes back to 2015, 2014, um, and it predates the all-pair model. It predates, you know, a lot of the reform efforts that, uh, you know, the, the state government is trying to encourage. And I just, um, and I, for example, the, the one that I focused on back in February was diabetes, that, uh, you know, the blueprint runs a uh, CDC diabetes program, uh, and statewide they only had 184 graduates in 2017, which is a small proportion. So you have one of the more severe morbidities um, in a program that is kind of like not in the mainstream of, 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 of funding for prevention. And um, so my, uh, I, you know, I, I've asked this almost a year ago, and uh, is that when, uh, you know, is the Vermont's benchmark plan going to be reviewed to have it aligned as to a maximum extent possible with the um, all-payer model goals, for example, 
Um, and uh, at, at the meeting in February, we actually changed the evaluation criteria for non-standard plans to encourage that. So, so I guess my 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 two questions are: Are we is uh, Diva on a path to try to uh, restructure the benchmark plan for the 2021 year? And if not, uh, are they looking to do it for the 2022 year? which ironically is the last year of the all fair model, but um, it just seems to me that this is a structural component of preventive health that is, is, uh, is way behind the times. Um, well, the 2021 year is definitely not, not that that ship has sailed on the benchmark plan. Um, we have been talking for a while about um, taking another look at the benchmark plan, and I, I can't speak to Diva's plans for – um, 2022, uh, I will say that the basic benefits that are included in the benchmark plan are pretty broad and pretty general. It's really in the, the, the biggest levers are really in the cost share space where you can boost somebody's access, if you will, um, by by removing financial barriers, the problem that you run into is that when you make a big change in one place, you have to make a big change in another place so that your AV values are still in line with the requirements. So you you are constantly playing this game of of taking from one and giving to the other. If you make big changes, what we're suggesting here, you know, is, is fairly small in the grand scheme of AV values, so, so it's not really an issue for these little changes. But the, to do something big, um, you've got to give up something. So I think that's one of the challenges with doing, like, a total overhaul of the benchmark plan. Um, but, you know, if DIVA does take that up, we're definitely interested and excited to participate in that um, process. And, and I think we would probably uh, be excited to bring more clinical thinking to that conversation than we have, uh, than we did, you know, the first time around, they just picked the Blue Cross plan that happened to be in the market. Um, so so it, it is exciting. I think it's more than anything. It's just, it's just having the time. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, respond to that a little bit by something that I said, um, you know, last uh, February, which was, you know, in Blue Cross Blue Shield's current year marketing brochure, for the bronze plan, it's, uh, it has a category called managing Joe's type 2 by diabetes. And the total example cost is 7400 bucks for a year, of which uh, $5,160 comes out of Joe's pocket. And it just seems to me when I, I look at that uh, where uh, versus what it costs the blueprint to operate a CDC-sanctioned best-in-the-business prevention plan, and uh, they're doing it on a shoestring, it seems to me that from an AV point of view, at least in this particular instance, you know, it, w it, 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 it would seem to be a, a, a reasonable trade-off. I don't know that. Um, I know that I've heard people say they don't want to open up the benchmark plan because, you know, people that, have, that were there back in 20, 2014 say it's a food fight, but uh, I, I just think that we're... Um, missing an opportunity to have our benchmark plan, which serves the QHP population as uh, uh, finely tuned as possible toward the pre prevention health kind of goals that we're trying to achieve. Yep. So I'm, I've got my fingers crossed for 2021 or 2022. Really noted. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? I have one, but I... But I think if somebody else wants to go first, that's fine. Well, go ahead, Jess. Okay. Um, I just, you know, this plan is obviously going to occupy a, a unique niche in the QHP market. It's going to be catering to, you know, those with cardiac disease and diabetes. So you had mentioned that 10% of the QHP population has heart disease and 5% have diabetes. So I'm wondering if the marketing is successful. Um, have your actuaries done any modeling on you know, what is the expected percentage of the population or expected percentage of the subscribers to this plan that will have heart disease, the percentage that will have diabetes, 
Um, I'm expecting it would probably be above the 10 and the 5 since it's catering to that. And then how then if, if those folks see the value in this plan um, and there's some movement, how would it affect the average risk? excuse me, average risk in the standard QHP plans if some of the more high-risk diabetics and heart disease patients move over? I'm going to let Martine correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding is, is that the risk is shared amongst the entire pool. So when you have people moving from place to place, it, it where the risk can, can be worse or better is when people leave the pool entirely. So say all the people leave um, the Blue Cross pool that don't have these conditions and leave only these folks with these conditions, that would have an impact. But if people are moving in, in, within Blue Cross between these, um, between plan choices, it's my understanding that doesn't have any impact on the actual risk pool because of the way that the, the pricing works and that the risk sharing works within the, mm -hmm. the merged market. Martine, did I butcher that sufficiently? No, that was really good. Maybe you can have a second career in actuarial services. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yes, so the the plans, the, the rules around rating for the plans uh, take out the morbidity at the plan level or the, the – um, the risk at the plan level and adjust all of the plans. And so it wouldn't, if all the, you know, Vermont diabetics decide to go in this one plan, that one particular plan is not going to be negatively impacted, you know, next year when we do increases because that impact will be spread across all of, um, all of the pool, both Great, on the claim you. side and the risk adjustment side. So. Yeah, I knew it would be on the risk adjustment side. I was just curious to some degree about some of the claim side, but um, thank you. That clarifies that. Okay, Robin or Maureen, any questions? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm good as well, thanks. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public for any public comment. Hey, Kevin, it's Walter. Hey, Walter. What's happening? <laughs> I just, Living I the dream, one, sheltering in place, Walter. <laughs> well, cheer up. Me too, watching the snow fly outside and the wind blow. Uh, I just have one question about all these plans we've been talking about. Is I don't think any there'd be too many people who can afford these plans anyway. And what happens to them? if they can and don't qualify for Medicaid or something like that. Because, you know, when you talk out-of-pocket expenses and AC values and deductibles, most people can't afford that. So, you know, I think all these plans are great, but, you know, they're just going to be dangling out there because who's going to pay 90 bucks? Or as Tom said, you know, it's going to cost them 5000 a year. And none of us are going to have that kind of money, especially now with this virus crap going around. And this is going to go on for months and months. So anyway, that's my question. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a question I can really answer, but the, you know, there is cost share reduction programs. So the benefits, um, that are the cost sharing levels are adjusted for income. I recognize that there's frustration with um, the level of those subsidies and the level of the cost share reduction program in general and, and the whole cliff when you uh, fall off the cliff and you don't qualify for any subsidies. Um, and those are obviously part of an ongoing conversation that we're having about the healthcare system in general, but not specific to this. Proposal, I guess. Oh, I haven't hey. seen any. Oop, go ahead. No, go ahead, Walter. Hey, I'm on a phone, so I haven't seen any of the slides yet, but uh, I'm just listening to it. You know, even with cost sharing reductions, it's probably still unaffordable. Anyway. <clears throat> Walter, well, fortunately, it's the one piece of insurance product, though, that does have assistance. Um, 
through the exchange, depending on the uh, level of income. I mean, I, I know it's not everything, but at least it's something. Other other public comment? This is Mort Wasserman. Just quickly, given we had a long discussion about telehealth, I wondered whether these visits that are part of this uh, plan can be conducted through telehealth, which would improve access for folks who don't want to make a trip. And many of these visits, especially nutrition counseling, don't require a lot of physical presence. So my understanding is that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has had telehealth reimbursement parity for a long time. And that what we really changed in light of the COVID crisis was um, waiving HIPAA compliance and paying for telephone visits with no visual. And so I think at some point, um, you know, the HIPAA compliance piece is obviously not a Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, you know, it's not up to us. The, um, but on the telephone, on, on telephone visits, we are starting to have conversations about um, where is that that visual part vital, and where might it not not be? Um, so we're, we are we are you know keeping a close eye on how this is changing the healthcare system, and um, you know there's if 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 telephone visits make sense. Um, from a clinical perspective, you know, I think you'll see some movement from us on that. Um, but again, on the, on the regular telehealth where you have both audio and visual, we have had um, a program in place that, that allows that and the reimbursement rate is the same for, for things that we've, that our folks think are clinically appropriate for that type of visit. But I think we're taking a fresh look at that list um, in light of what we're learning and we'll continue to do that. Other members of the, the public? Hearing none, is there a board member who would like to make a motion? Robin? <laughs> sure. Uh, I move approval of the Blue Cross Blue Shield non-standard plan design changes. I'll second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, uh, Council Barber, if you could call the roll. Member Easter? Yes. Member Pelham? Um, I'll vote yes with the hopeful expectation that the next time around next year we will be in the middle of a uh, reassessment of the benchmark plan. Yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you, Rebecca and Martine. And uh, um, at this point, we're going to go to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? And I wanted to bring up an item here. Um, we as a board, because of the open meeting law, are not in, allowed to have conversations about the hospital budget process in uh, private. So I wanted to um, just bring up something so that uh, it's out there in the public and that my um, colleagues on the board could understand um, where I'm thinking um, for the hospital budget guidance for 2021. And um, my thoughts are simply this, that because of these unprecedented times with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that uh, really this is not the time to be taking any enforcement action on 19. With that being said, it's also um, 2020, um, the year that we're in is also uh, a year that isn't going to mean much because the world has changed. And what we've seen is an incredible decline in non-COVID-related um, 
healthcare in the state of Vermont. And so um, because of that, all the hospitals are in uh, financial turmoil and trying to deal with the situation. So they have been very clear that they do not see um, a way to have a traditional budget process. And uh, so my thoughts are to to delay the submission of the uh, budgets till the uh, middle of the summer, that um, it be a simple thing with NPR, where we did go through the process to grant them their 2020 budgets. They're, what I'm suggesting is that for NPR, we strictly say that you're gonna get um, three and a half percent increase on your 2020 budget for 2021. And we're not gonna do any enforcement for 2020 because the enforcement would all be on the downside and it would be inappropriate because of the unprecedented situation that we're in. So what I'm suggesting to explain in, in kind of a, what I think is an easy way for everyone to understand what I'm proposing is to use as an example, um, take a hospital that has a fictitious NPR that we granted for 2020 of $100 million. We would, we would grant them an NPR for 2021 of 103,500,000. And the enforcement for 2021 would be a combination of the two years combined. So it would be 203,500,000 and um, that will deal with whether or not we will have pent up demand. There are two conflicting theories on that. Um, some people believe that there's a lot of deferred medical treatment that um, has taken place and that will occur in 2021. And then there are some people who believe that this may change um, people's perception of getting care and that you may see a continued reduction. But in any event, um, it would give the flexibility to the hospitals to manage um, to that $203,500,000 level for the hospital with the um, $100 million um, NPR approval for 2020. Um, I'm not um, looking for a debate or anything, but I just wanted to throw it out there so that um, all my colleagues would know what I'm thinking. And um, at some point um, we will have a meeting and we'll be able to hear um, everyone's thoughts and we'll figure this out in a way that um, recognizes that hospitals are laser focused on dealing with the current crisis and we have to have a budget process for this year that will meet that understanding. I did reach out to general counsel to confirm that um, because the statute is very clear that we have to do a budget for each year, um, but we're still doing a budget for 2021. We did a budget for 2020 that this would fall within that. I know that some people from the hospital community had proposed to me that we do a two year budget for 21 and 22. I still don't think that we have legislative authority to do that at this point in time. And so um, I think what I've laid out um, recognizes the abilities that we do have and recognizes the, uh, the sheer fact that um, anything at this point in time is, is pure conjecture and meaningless because we don't have enough data and we don't know what the true effects are going to be. So is there any new business to come from other members of the board? Uh, Kevin, this is Maureen. Just, just want to comment a little bit um, on what you're bringing up. Um, knowing that we're not going to make any decisions today, I, I do think the concept of looking at, you know, what's lost in 2020 to be added to 21, you know, and I think the way you laid it out is kind of a simple 
way to do that. I, I, I do think that would be a good thing that we may want to look at when we finalize things. Um, also, just because I have been working with the staff on, um, you know, what type of budget process we will have, and I think we're planning to try to present that on May 6th. I think next week there's not going to be necessarily enough time on the calendar, so I think we're looking at May 6th, so people can kind of look out for that date, you know, from the hospital piece. Um, I will, from a, a little bit of a preview, say that we've engaged um, several of the CFOs that um, have worked with us in the past, just kind of, you know, on our when we've done things off cycle and have worked with some of the CFOs, we gave them a very scaled down um, P&L balance sheet type of a submission and it was very favorably received. So I was really um, happy with the feedback that we got from the CFOs. I was even looking at maybe going something way more scaled back and the, the staff at Green Mountain Care Board kind of came up with a, a little bit deeper analysis. And when we sent that to the four CFOs that we talked to, um, they even added a little bit more to it, but were very favorably, it was very favorably received by them what we might be requesting. So I, we all so know. Maureen, that, isn't that, um, didn't you guys work to try to more align the reporting with the monthly reporting so that it's all very similar? A little bit, yes. And then there may be some ads to that about some of the, the uh, funding that's going to be received because of COVID and how that works. Um, but I, I was just pleased that, look, look, we all know every budget, I've always said anyway, every budget is obsolete day one. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we know whatever submissions we have that those budgets um, are going to be obsolete and we expect there'll be a much more fluid process, I would hope, during the year. Um, that said, I'm not 100% aligned about, you know, not having enforcement. Um, so I think we'd have to have further discussions on that. I don't expect we're going to have um, people that are exceeding the numbers and that it's an enforcement where we are imposing um, restrictions on their, you know, what they need to do with an excess. I just would have a question or concern about potentially giving up something that we don't know yet <laughs> about what could happen in the future. So, and I, and I do agree that in the past. So let me, let me be clear. What I was talking about was no enforcement for 2020. I get it, but I'm not sure I'm a hundred percent there as well until 2020 okay. ends because, um, you know, there's just so much going on. I, I don't think anyone's going to exceed their number. And I'm not anticipating what what would what would be required if some fall so short. But the biggest thing here is right making sure that they're all financially viable and sustainable in the long term. And and I know everyone's trying to do that, so I'm not second guessing that. But there's possibilities that maybe the decisions they're making aren't going to get them there. And so so where would enforcement come? And that's all I'm saying. I just. You know, it, it could very well be we do nothing under the circumstances. I just don't know what the benefit is of coming out with that right now. That would be just my point of view on let's see what happens, um, you know, as as time progresses um, before we, we, you know, formally say we're not doing it. That, that's the only reason why. I, I, I can't anticipate what it's going to be, but I wouldn't want to look back and say, oh, boy, I wish we hadn't said we weren't going to do anything because, you know, these two or three hospitals might be going out of business because we didn't get enough funding. I mean, I'm, I'm speculating completely. I'm just trying to throw out examples of why, you know, maybe there's maybe we could be helpful in an enforcement process. Uh, yes, I mean that our all of us share the goal of having a healthy health care system, and we do not want to um, see something come out similar to what happened with the state college system this past week. And uh, I think everybody's got to get in the boat and, and row together and uh, come out the other side of this with a, a continued healthy uh, health care system and know that this could happen again in the future. So we have to learn from everything that we're doing now and um, move forward. Can I just add one thing? Um, and that's sure. just about 
your point, uh, Kevin, about the data and right now anything that's submitted would not be based in reality. And I just want to echo that. I mean, obviously, we don't know if there's going to be another surge uh, after we reopen the economy. We don't know if there's going to be pent up demand. There's so much we don't know. And so I guess I would ask, I hope that the hospital budget team and, you know, are thinking about when is the ideal and optimal submission date. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned, Kevin, you know, midsummer. Um, if we waited a month, would the data be more meaningful? Would there be less uncertainty? So I don't know what the optimal date is, but my hope is that when the data is submitted, it's as meaningful as possible. And if, if waiting a month allows, you know, more information, I would be open to that. So I just want to add, we should be really focusing a little bit on the meaningfulness and the timing of the data. Oh, I would also just add to that, though, that, um, you know, it could be a different process, right? We, we could have um, submissions, you know, delayed a bit from, from when we originally had them and sometime in the summer, you know, um, still giving out budget um, you know, fulfilling what we need to do from our, our statutory requirements for budget, but then meeting more frequently or, or having touch points, whether it's meeting or not, during the course of the year because it will be so evolving. You know, I'm not sure any of us could peg a date at any time in the rest of this year where a 12-month outlook, you know, we would have a much better handle, right, unless we really get a, a handle on knowing if this is going to reoccur and what would happen or, we, or would then we still be not doing non-essential, all, all of that, right? So Short of a I, vaccine, I think, yep. You know, so, so I think the point is, and, and knowing that there are, even with all this uncertainty, there's still a need to be doing budgeting and planning, and people will be doing that from a staffing side, from an expense side. Um, and again, it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of assumptions that won't be correct, but they're still going to be doing it. And they also need to do it for their banks, for their board, and things like that. So I think we're, you know, we'll, we're trying to be really supportive in what it is, but understanding I would envision that it's going to be a lot more conversational when we have the meetings with the hospitals because from whenever they submit to when we meet with them, things will have changed. And so I, I think, um, you know, that's my point of view. And I just think we'll have to be really open to, to that change and knowing during the course of the year, um, you know, there'll probably be lots of, there will be lots of uncertainty and, you know, significant changes could occur. But the, you know, the other part, too, um, on delaying too much is, you know, we have also heard from the insurance side, right, that they need, they would like to have um, some visibility into what type of insurance rates that may be approved and may be in the budgets. And, um, you know, we know there's always a catch up there and it's not an exact that they get what that what was in the budgets for sure. But, you know, they would like to have visibility on that. So we're trying to be cognizant of that piece, too, when we look at, um, you know, when we look at that. So that's just another factor. Yeah, we they, They've been very clear that they believe that um, we have to stick to the uh, current calendar process in order for them to have a fair shake at uh, um the, the rate review, but at the, I just seeing what we're seeing, I don't think that's realistic. No, that may not be, but there does have to be a point where the hospitals have a green light on the rates that they're putting in, right? So, so that that's not December, right? That's not November. That's not, you know, they've basically said even at the hospital level when we've talked to them that they probably need to know need to know is sometime in October, maybe by November 1st, but in that time frame in order to make sure they've got that all in their contracts with the insurance company. So I, I just think we need to understand that part of it too, if we push it out too long, and then if we do make any determinations that impact insurance requests that may have been, you know, that they would like, um, they won't be able to get it. It won't be negotiated. Um, you know, or we, or we won't be ghost, we won't have approved it if we need to. So I, I just think, you know, when you look at the timelines, there's, there's other factors too. Yep. Um, is there any other new business to come before the board? Hearing none, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? 
So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Council Barber, could you call the roll? Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Yusufer? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Um, it looks like the sun is actually trying to peak out here. Um, hasn't come out yet, but if the wind would stop, it could be fairly nice. Be safe, everyone. Shelter Take in care. place. Follow social distancing. Thank you. Thank you.